briefly, as I'll start by talking about deep learning for medical image reconstruction. I was also going to tell you a little bit about theory of that, but the theory of that is not ready, so I'll just talk about theory of other neural networks. And at the end, I'll try to hand wave my way through, through the connection, but it is connected, so somehow. <laughs> okay, so, uh, so basically, in, in the first part, I'll talk about deep learning for MR reconstruction, and uh, in, in particular, a, a new class of neural networks that uh, we've been kind of uh, designing, and this part is uh, joint work with uh, two of my students, Alan Fabian, who led most of the work, and Berk Tinas. So uh, in, in MR reconstruction, many of you are familiar with, you know, you have the, the scanner, right? Uh, you get some measurements, right? Uh, these measurements are kind of samples from the Fourier domain or k-space of, of the image, right? So, so what, what you see is like Fourier transform under sampling plus noise. And of course, the question is how do you go back, right? Now, um, now the actual problem is a little bit more complicated than that, right? Because usually you also have uh, multiple coils, right? So, so you have the ground truth anatomy, but then you have this coil sensitivity maps. Uh, then the Fourier transform, then noise, uh, and, uh, the, and you know, then under sampling. So, so that, that's kind of the overall measurement process. And now the question is, given a bunch of under sampled co coil, um, you know, measurements, how do you actually go back to the signal space? Uh, and again, uh, back in the day, we used sparse recovery or compressed sensing uh, for these kinds of reconstructions. Uh, you know, we, we had kind of a data consistency term and then a regularizer. And, and these days, uh, you know, one approach that is very popular, uh, you know, other folks have talked about other deep learning approaches, like I think Paul uh, yesterday talked about GANs, uh, is end-to-end -end deep learning reconstruction. Uh, this is what Ben called the machine learning through examples, right? You, you, you basically get a bunch of inputs, the measurements, the corresponding images, and you just try to learn the inverse directly. Right, and I'll restrict uh, to this class because uh, at least in, in this kind of, uh, you know, system, these are the ones that seem to work better. Um, and, you know, luckily now for MR, uh, in particular for this fast MRI or, or accelerated uh, MR imaging, there's a good data sets out there. So this is a particular data set uh, by NYU and Facebook, which is fast MRI, and, uh, you know, they, it's a relatively rich data set, you know, they have different parts of the anatomy, different scanners, you know, uh, different weights, TV weights, and so on, so, um, so it's a pretty rich data set. And if you look at, like, uh, basically the, the public leaderboard, uh, at least until recently, you know, everything is kind of end-to-end -end methods, right? And, uh, you know, another thing is that except for, like, a kind of a private company that has not released their code, like this top of the leaderboard has stayed kind of the same uh, for the past two years, right? And uh, what we were wondering, and this is what's not our main objective, oh, and I should say all of these uh, approaches work uh, based on, first of all, end-to-end -end reconstruction combined with this idea of unrolled networks. So, so all of these top of the leaderboard have this key idea in it. So here the idea is that, okay, uh, remember like this inverse problem formulation uh, in compressive sensing, you have a data consistency term and then a regularizer. So uh, how do you do end-to-end -end reconstruction? How do you do machine learning through examples? Here uh, the idea is that if you had these classical approaches, uh, you could basically solve them iteratively, right? Which would be, uh, you know, I, I have the gradient of the data consistency term and then gradient of the regularizer. Now, of course, the question would be what regularizer would you pick, right? And, and then now what you can do is, uh, instead of like thinking about what regularizer to put, is uh, you can basically parameterize the regularizer or at least the gradient of the regularizer as a neural network directly. And so if you use this idea, then, you know, you start from some initialization. You, you have your data consistency term. You, you have like a neural network which is supposed to model the gradient of the regularizer, you add it, and then you, you keep iterating. Uh, it means that basically you, you keep adding a, another network and another network. Uh, and then, uh, you know, you have a bunch of input measurements, the corresponding reconstruction, right? These are the training examples. The, you try to learn all of these parameters of these models, right? So this is how uh, unrolling works. So in some sense, it's actually quite related uh, to the previous approaches. Uh, 
it is a little bit strange uh, to, you know, to completely learn the inverse mapping uh, through just seeing examples, right? Uh, but, you know, uh, I was actually surprised that this works, but it, it's kind of growing on me. And uh, maybe at the end of the talk, I can tell you why this is maybe possible, even mathematically. So, uh, so these are uh, the unrolled networks. So uh, the, the leading, uh, you know, network uh, at the time, is, it, it does this unrolling in the Fourier domain. Uh, so so you, you just basically do, do this unrolling instead of the X space in kind of the K space. So, so that, that's one trick uh, that they used, uh, which was very effective. And then, uh, of course, the coil sensitivity maps themselves are also estimated from the data. So, so you have a kind of a different network to, to estimate these coil sensitivity maps and then aggregate uh, the data into a single image. Uh, uh, and that, that's kind of the whole pipeline. You know, from the data, you have the shape uh, matrix estimation, which you also estimate these coil sensitivity maps. So, so this is kind of the entire kind of pipeline now. Okay, so, so this is the state of the art. And so what we thought uh, when we came into this, we, we, we kind of uh, have other problems that we care about. I'll tell you briefly about them. But, uh, you know, uh, we thought, okay, w w what kind of networks should we be using here? Uh, you know, uh, again, one of the popular networks at the beginning, at least, uh, in, in these E2E varnet is to use like kind of a unit network, right? Uh, but we thought, okay, uh, can we do better with kind of modern architectures? And, and of course, the modern architecture, a lot of people are, are thinking about these days is transformers. You know, it's kind of like there's 10% that they're satient or something, right? You were at Nura. Yeah, 10%, yeah. Less than 10. Less than 10, okay, cool. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so we thought, okay, uh, can we kind of make transformers work in this context? And what we ended up with is like this Hummus net. So I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about this. Um, okay, so. What are the potential benefits of transformers in this context, right? One is that, you know, the convolutional kernels are content independent, right? So, so you can see why that could be beneficial, right? And then they, they're also supposedly good at modeling long-range dependencies, right? So if you have a piece of bone structure on one side and then another uh, piece of tissue of the same kind on the other side, potentially they, they can capture this a little bit better than convolutional networks, right? Um, now, the way they do this, I won't get into to the process, but just uh, you know, briefly to, to point out the, the, their computational bottleneck is through the self-attention mechanism. Uh, basically, based on your input data, you create like these key query value pairs. Uh, you, you calculate some sort of dot products, right, uh, the, which is like at the center of this uh, self-attention mechanism, and, and uh, that's how they work. Uh, you know, the details of the self-attention mechanism are not too important for us, but uh, one issue, uh, especially when it comes to uh, deep learning reconstruct, well, uh, if for in the context of imaging, is that uh, you, you can see that this computation is quadratic in the size of the patches, and that, that creates, again, memory issues. Uh, so, so how do you deal with quadratic patches? So that's the first thing we, we have to deal with. So the, the, it turns out that there's a kind of an approximate solution to this, which is, you, you calculate these kind of dot products, not through, the, uh, through all of the patches, but through blocks of patches. And uh, then you, from one iteration to the next, you kind of shift these blocks. So this is uh, what is known as kind of local window attention. And, and so this leads, if you have these kind of uh, local window attention ideas, combine them uh, with uh, some convolutional layers, this is what is known as kind of these swine transformers. Uh, so it turns out that they're pretty good for image reconstruction tasks, in particular swine transformers were proposed in the context of super resolution. So they kind of are transformer convolutional hybrids. They have like the benefits of long range dependencies that come uh, from the self attention mechanism, but at the same time they, they have a little bit of the implicit bias of the convolutional architectures. Uh, so, so at least in the, uh, some inverse problems these seem to work well. Now. Um, and yeah, they're also single scale processing things, so, so that's good. So then, uh, you know, uh, we, we, we decided to try this and compare with uh, basically Varnet. Uh, so again, as Ben said, you, you kind of fit the largest one that fits into memory, right? And, and uh, uh, you know, it, it, it actually does not do so well. 
Uh, this is an SSIM score. It's very sensitive. So, so actually, one percent here is, is somewhat significant, right? So, so if you just try something like this, it doesn't work uh, so well. At least the l largest one that would fit into GPU memories. So, so then, uh, what we thought is, of course, MR images are kind of multi-scale in nature. So, and and these kind of transformers are not utilizing that multi-scale nature, right? And if you think about even the, the networks that do work well already in this context, are like the unit has this multi-scale kind of wavelets almost structure to it. Uh, and so we thought, okay, what if we kind of try to create that uh, with the line transformers? Uh, so we, we do a bunch of downsampling and upsampling and, and put in some of these swine transformer blocks in there. So this is how we end up with this multi-scale hybrid feature extractor, essentially. So if we do this and again, pick the largest one that fits into memory, we kind of getting close to, to the state of the art, uh, but still not, not fully there, okay? So, so that was kind of the second idea. Uh, the, the reason, you know, this is particularly challenging, the reason this doesn't really work is really because of the memory requirements. Because uh, unlike, you know, classification, uh, there is really high resolution challenge here. Uh, in the sense that the input images are really much larger than a lot of the classification tasks. Like, uh, you know, the, if you look at actual MR images, uh, they're much more higher resolution. And in the context of classification, you usually can get away with uh, larger patch sizes. So, so what you would do is you, you have these larger patch sizes. From these, you create sort of token embeddings which you then feed into like a vision transformer and then you get the classification out. In the context of imaging, uh, first of all, uh, the output is now very much higher resolution because you out the output is also an image. And it turns out that uh, you really need very fine uh, patches. So, so in fact, you need patches of size one by one for things to work out. And so this is why you end up with this really large scale uh, token embeddings, which uh, kind of don't really fit into memory, right? And so that, that is kind of the bottleneck. So this is why you cannot build really large networks because then the token embedding uh, uh, doesn't fit into memory. And just to show that this patch size is actually pretty important, you really need small patch sizes. If you actually repeat the previous experiment, but use patch sizes of even two by two, you get a significant reduction in SSIM. So, so you really need these different patch sizes. So uh, to deal with this issue, kind of our solution was to we first extract some high resolution features via convolutions. Uh, then extract some lower resolution features. This is what we actually feed into the transformers, uh, but then combine them again with a, another convolutional architecture. And as is also common in this area, we also wrap it into a residual network. Uh, and so this is, this is our, our building block now. So this is kind of the Hummus net. So it kind of has like the multi-scale from kind of like unit, but uh, some, some of the properties of transformers. Uh, and of course, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we also unroll, right? So that's one trick that is very common in this area. Uh, we do the unrolling, uh, so we, this is how we create the different layers. Uh, and then another common trick here, which improves reconstruction, is that you actually use free consecutive, uh, you know, basically slices for reconstruction, but uh, you predict one, and so, so we also use that trick. Uh, so so that, that's another trick that is uh, boosts performance a little bit. Again, all of these uh, approaches do that one though. Uh, so, so here's our result um, for, for, for the, you know, on this fast MRI data set. Uh, so we, we actually do beat state of the art uh, slightly, but the numbers are really not uh, that important. It's barely. <laughs> so um, this is on basic the fast MRI data set. Uh, it, you know, this also, we also did this on a bunch of other data sets, including Stanford uh, 3D uh, multi-coil uh, with eight factor acceleration. So, so we get improvements in all, all of these data sets. Um, again, the, the differences look small, but, uh, you know, if you again look at the leaderboard, the, the differences are really minute. So, so this actually is actually uh, quite a good gap. Um, and this measure is actually somewhat sensitive. So, um, Okay, so uh, the, these are some of the reconstructions. You can actually see that the images are pretty nice. Um, so so the, the, some reconstructions. I do want to mention that I, we don't really care so much about uh, getting this minor improvements in terms of PSNR or SSIM. Uh, 
why, why we got into using transformers in this context is because we think uh, they're particularly good at uh, basically reducing reliance in data when combined with other techniques, right? So, so what we have right now is like, uh, for example, if you reduce the size of the training data from 100 to 1%, if you combine it with some sort of data augmentation scheme, you, you actually get a better performance, right? So, so you actually can, uh, you know, get, Im improve accuracy even with like much less data. But we think, uh, and these are kind of predictions, right? We think like uh, using transformers instead of the classical RC textures, you could do better. So we're still working on that. And, and kind of our dream is can we actually get away with 1% of the training data, potentially, right? So using 100% of the training data, just use 1%. Um, and, uh, you know, just to say, uh, this is where we are now, right? Uh, so slightly better here, but this is kind of our dream, right, to, to get to this point. And, and just to demonstrate that, you know, this SSIM scores, again, look really similar, but there's actually, there are actually major differences in the actual picture, right? Again, not so visible on the slide, but, but it is there. And, and the reason we particularly care about re reducing the size of the training data is kind of two things, right? Uh, and again, this is work in progress, really, is, uh, first of all, what we've observed, and this is actually in a paper with Reinhardt, right, uh, which is like, if you manage to reconstruct with less data, somehow uh, less training data, not, not more acceleration, less just samples, then somehow this it seems to usually translate into improving robustness. You know, this robustness could to be to different things, for example, to unseen scanners, right? Uh, uh, so you, you kind of image, uh, you know, you kind of do your measurements with one scanner, like from one company, and then you switch to a different company. Uh, even unseen anatomies, like you, you kind of have training data based on knee, but then you go to the brain and so on. Uh, and uh, another thing which is kind of a, a little bit worrying about using neural network in this context, uh, they do have some uh, hallucination problems, right? Uh, which sometimes they actually even hallucinate diagnostically significant details, right? And, and it seems like when you actually can reconstruct with less training data, they're less prone to, to hallucinate, right? Um, again, in, in here, but, uh, you know, again, it's not very visible, but basically there's some lesions, tear lesions that got, has gotten hallucinated. But when you do reconstruct using less training data, if you, if you do a good job, they actually go, seem to go away. So, so that, that's, um, that's uh, why uh, we're kind of moved to the, toward this, these kinds of approaches. Uh, in particular, one thing that I'm really excited about, this is again work in progress, is uh, could we potentially use these techniques now to do low, uh, kind of like uh, high performance low field MRI? So here the idea is that, you know, uh, most MR machines are really gigantic. They, they kind of uh, occupy really large spaces and so on. Can we actually go almost to the bedside, right? So can we actually have uh, MR machines that are much smaller? So, so the problem with this is that the noise level is much, much higher in this space, right? So, uh, and, uh, but the, the advantage is, uh, is that first of all, it's less expensive because you have smaller magnet, it takes less space, and you could also use it in applications that you would not typically be able to use MR for. Like for example, if people have like pacemakers, stuff like that, right? So, uh, but, but the cons of this is, again, the noise is high, right? Because you're, you're actually using smaller magnets, the, the, the magnetic field is smaller. So high noise, and more important, this is why I care about reducing the size of the training data. Uh, you know, there's kind of only three high performance MR magnets in the US right now. So, so you have much, much less training data, right? So you cannot gather these large data sets. Luckily at USC, we do have one of them. So, so that's why I got into this, okay? So, uh, so that's kind of the, the dream, right? Um, so now I'll, I'll actually switch gears. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about the theory of end-to-end -end reconstruction, why it makes sense. It's not ready though. So, so I'll just tell you about uh, theory of neural networks. It's, it's, it's going to be the same machinery that we're trying to actually make for, for basically end-to-end -end reconstruction though. And uh, so, so I'm switching gears. Uh, I'm going to tell you about how neural networks are capable of learning features, essentially, right? Uh, so, and this is beyond uh, these kind of NTK structures. Um, so, and again, uh, you know, it's, it's now like 2022, so there's a lot of theories about neural networks, right? And in fact, it's a popular thing to give talk titles like, you know, theoretical foundations of X, right? Where X is like deep learning, reinforcement learning, AI, whatever. Uh, 
But more often than not, these foundations are a little bit shaky, and I'll tell you why. Um, so so let, let me tell you briefly why we kind of need stronger theoretical foundations in this space. So the first one is that a lot of the theory we have is incapable of explaining a lot of practical things, right? For example, what kind of architecture you use, whether it's fully connected, convolutional, or transformer in this case. You know, a lot of uh, things having to do with normalization, batch norm, group norm, stuff like that. And also even a lot of contemporary practices, which again, are very closely tied to feature learning and representation learning. Like these practices of pre-training, fine-tuning, or even knowledge distillation. They're very common, but, but the existing theory doesn't really provide any insight about these things. So, but this is like the grander picture. Uh, it's actually even worse than that. Uh, existing theory doesn't even work in toy settings, okay? So uh, what do I mean by that is that most of the existing theory works with all the wrong hyperparameters, right? Uh, so very uh, kind of small step size, very wide networks, very large initialization scales. And this may seem insignificant, but actually because these neural networks are, are a very rich function class, they can actually do a lot of different things uh, with different hyperparameters, so they actually are important. So to demonstrate this, uh, you know, that let's keep things simple. Just have a one hidden layer neural network, okay? And I'm going to try to fit a bunch of points in 3D using this one hidden layer neural network. So this is if I use like these theory oriented hyperparameters, uh, I get very erratic surfaces for interpolating these 3D points. Uh, whereas like if you use uh, the ones that are used in practice, you know, you get much smoother, nicer surfaces, okay? So, so even in these toy settings, a kind of existing theory is not telling us the right answers, okay? So, um, so yeah, like I'll, I'll try to kind of build an alternative theory to, 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 to avoid these, these issues. Uh, and again, really, there the, are the kind of two running challenges, is challenges here. A lot of it has to do with this idea of over-parameterization without overfitting. Neural networks have way more parameters than training data. We expect overfitting to happen. For whatever reason, we kind of get really good fits, right? Uh, there's kind of two mysteries associated with this phenomenon. One is, you know, optimization. And this, this is a really cool example that I'm sure at this point a lot of you have seen. So imagine you generate data according to one hidden layer neural network. Then you train a model of the same size to fit to the same network, right? So if you run gradient descent, you actually hit a local optimum. Right? Uh, but if you actually over-parameterize the model, in this case by had adding more hidden units, uh, all of a sudden gradient descent does converge to global optimum. Actually, even this kind of experiment, we really don't have good explanations for still, okay? So, so then the question becomes, why is it that gradient descent you know, can get you to global optimality, right? Even in a simple setting. And the second one is kind of has to do with generalization. So uh, in the sense that you know, now, because you over-parameterize, you have a lot of hidden units, there's actually potentially many global optimum in the training loss. So the picture in the training loss may look something like this, but all, not all of them are created equal. Some, uh, they, they basically have different test accuracy. So maybe you initialize somewhere here, you get some test error. You initialize a little bit further, you get actually a worse test error. And then the question is, why is it that gradient descent actually, or stochastic gradient descent actually gives you um, you know, and by the way, this is not a toy picture. This is a toy picture, but this phenomenon is not toy. You can actually get different uh, test errors by just changing the scale of random initialization, essentially. And, and so here is like kind of a good uh, experiment to demonstrate this. So in this experiment, still the same problem. We're kind of fitting a one hidden, uh, the data is generated according to a one hidden layer network, and we are also fitting a one hidden layer network to the, to the data. Uh, what we're doing is we're just changing the scale of random initialization in these experiments. You can see in all cases, you get zero training error, but uh, you get fundamentally different test behavior by just changing the scale of random initialization. So the issue is that existing theory actually lies here. So, so you actually get very high test error. So uh, this is uh, what is known as kind of a neural tangent kernel or NTK regime, right? So, so this is that regime of operation. Essentially what it says is that even though neural networks are nonlinear, they essentially behave linear on top of like these kernel features, right? So they essentially behave like kernel methods. Uh, but what happens in practice is kind of there, right? You actually learn a lot more useful things, okay? Uh, 
you learn good features. Uh, and, and so that's kind of the, the kind of the mystery we want to uh, understand, which is why is it that gradient descent from small random initialization actually learns useful features, generalizes actually. Uh, and so this is actually a, a nice uh, depiction of this phenomena. So uh, again, same experiment. So we have data generated according to a neural network with three hidden units. And we're trying to fit a model with more units. So we can visualize this by looking at the embed, uh, the hidden nodes as like kind of vectors in higher dimensions. So associated with each hidden node, we have like the corresponding vector that goes to the input. Uh, we also multiply it by the absolute, uh, absolute value of the output. So with this depiction, for each hidden node, you kind of get a point in hierarchy, right? And uh, so, so you get a bunch of different points. And then the free black lines are actually the direction of the planted model, right? These are the direction of the model where the data was created from. So it was from a free hidden unit model, right? So by, uh, so, so now if I run gradient descent, I can keep track of how these points evolve across time, right? And see what's happening. So in the non-lazy regime, what's happening, you start small, from small initialization. You can see all of these hidden units eventually align themselves with one of the three black lines, right? Uh, so, so essentially, the neural the gradient descent has found the simple structure underlying the data, right? Uh, the, it basically has found the free uh, hidden uh, layer kind of neural network. In this lazy or NTK regime, though, what happens is it's kind of really odd. Basically, all the hidden nodes move around a little bit, right? to make the training error zero, but you don't really find any kind of simple structure, right? So you, you cannot actually identify the, the planted uh, networks, right? So this is why it's called kind of a lazy regime because you barely move around. And so we want to really understand neural networks in this regime. Um, yeah, and the kind of the issue is that uh, basically the existing theory does not apply in these practical regimes. Uh, so, so that's what I want to really talk about is learning beyond this lazy regime. So I'll do it in, in kind of the context of three, three problems, really two, which one, if the first one is lower entry construction, it's just because understanding the theory is easier in this. Then I'll go to one hidden layer neural networks. At the end, I'll briefly try to connect it to how, what, what is really happening also in end to end. It, it, it turns out that these three problems are kind of end up being quite similar. Okay, so the lower entry construction, uh, this is joint work with uh, Dominique and uh, Changzi. Uh, so, so here we, we're, we're using a simpler model than neural networks just because it's un easier to understand theory and then we will actually go to actual neural networks. So, so in, in low rank reconstruction, the formulation is something like you get measurements from a low rank matrix. So, so in this case, imagine the underlying matrix is of rank R, right, R star. Now, if you want to over parameterize the model, you fit uh, basically a matrix of higher rank uh, in, in the optimization process. So you end up with some sort of non-convex optimization problem like this, but because you're over-parameterizing, R is bigger than R star, right? So, so that's kind of the setting. And the algorithm is again similar, you just run gradient descent from small random initialization. So that, that's fairly simple. So here, like, you know, the optimization challenge remains. Uh, you know, actually a lot of us has, have actually worked, including uh, in the room on this, right? How do you deal with non-convexity? There is kind of different approaches. Uh, you know, uh, one technique, uh, which is a kind of stuff uh, we did back in the day, including with Ben, uh, was, you know, spectral initialization plus local convergence. So here the idea is that you kind of come up with some sort of small smart initialization and then say locally the algorithm converges after that. And then uh, there's also a lot of other uh, non-gradient descent based approaches which study more the landscape try to understand what, where are the bad parts of the landscapes and how can you avoid them. But uh, surprisingly in this over parameterized regime, if you talk about just gradient descent from small random initialization, even that question is not resolved, even the simpler problem, right? And then uh, that's kind of like the easy problem, which is the optimization one, we have some insights in. But the generalization one is even more tricky uh, because again, we're interested in this over parameterized regime. So you have more parameters than the size of the training data. But of course, the size of the training data is more than the true number of parameters, right? So, uh, so, so in, 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 this is the setting. In this case, actually, if you apply this kind of existing theory or NTK theory, 
it's fairly easy to show that you get zero training error. So, so that's not hard, right? To show that gradient descent gets zero training error is easy. But again, the question is, can you get good test error? Uh, and with the, the kind of results that exist, you actually cannot get good test error. And interestingly, the, the, the kind of curves look exactly like neural network. So as I change the scale of initialization, the training error stays zero. So this is the scale of random initialization. But the test error is very high uh, when you use large scale of initialization. When you use a small scale of initialization, it's actually low. Again, the problem is that ex this existing NTK theory, including this result, actually operates here, not here. Right? And so that's what we want to understand is when you use small random initialization, how is it that you generalize? Right? So, so that this question is exactly the same as with neural networks. Now, the key idea, the, before I tell you about the result, is that Essentially, gradient descent has certain spectral biases as it's running its algorithm. Uh, the, the, that, that's what we're exploiting. So, and essentially, the surprise here is that gradient descent plus overparameterization essentially behaves like running power method on certain fixed matrices or, or tensors in the case of neural networks. Uh, and let me just show you this, and I'll, I'll tell you later what these fixed matrices are. But yeah, here is like a comparison between running gradient descent and running power method on a fixed matrix, okay? From starting from small random initialization. So you can see initially, the trajectory of gradient descent and power method is exactly on top of each other, right? And of course, uh, eventually they will diverge, but by that time you're fairly close to the global optimum and then you can do some sort of local convergence analysis. So why is this significant? Because all of us can analyze power method on a fixed matrix, right? So, so the, you know, so we can keep track of the trajectory of non-convex gradient descent by just running power method on a fixed matrix, which I'll tell you about what it is. It actually turns out to be exactly the matrix that we used to do power method for spectral initialization. So, so that, that's kind of an interesting connection. And here you can see that the angle, you know, they're really on top of each other. Initially, gradient descent. So here is like the angle between gradient descent and the top eigenvectors of that matrix and power method and the top eigenvectors. You can see initially for the first few iterations, they're really on top of each other. So that's kind of our key insight. I'll come back to this and tell you where this comes from. But basically, it's using this kind of technique that we can do this analysis. So for simplicity, I'm going to assume uh, the, the matrix is kind of condition number is 01, and we're using Gaussian measurement. So here's the kind of result we can show. When the model is overparameterized and you have sufficiently number of measurements, this is a little bit higher than it should be, but that's OK. Uh, so if you use gradient descent from small random initialization, um, which we specify, you actually do get the low test error. Uh, I mean, these dependencies are not optimal, but the point is that as you set alpha to go to zero, actually your test error does go to zero, which is what NTK kind of results cannot achieve, right? So, so that's the key point here. Uh, and uh, you know, I, do, I do want to mention that these results are, are uh, kind of some, some history about these results. So even when the model is not overparameterized, uh, this is actually the first result that only relies on RIP, not just Gaussian measurements. So it's like gradient descent from random initialization converges with good rates. Uh, so, so even the, in the R equals R star case, this is interesting. Um, so in the random case, there, there is like this interesting analysis uh, by Chen and co-authors, uh, but it, it's based on a leave one out technique, so it really utilizes randomness. Um, the other special case which is interesting is when R is, heavy, is equal to D, this is heavy overparameterization. This was actually a best paper award I called a few years ago. But there's kind of a lot of technical differences in this case. In particular, uh, this result requires sample complexity to go to infinity as you let the initialization scale go to zero, whereas ours is fixed. And finally, because this is an asymmetric result, uh, uh, you know, and there's other technical benefits compared to this, but uh, there is also an interesting result uh, by Jiang Chen and Ding uh, in the population case, in the asymmetric case, but, but not so much in, in this undersample scenario. So, so let me just tell you about what, what is the, you know, how, how is it that the small random initialization does power method, and that, that's the only proof that I'm going to do. So there is an interesting reduction to the symmetric case, but that's lengthy, so I'll skip that. So let's pretend that things are symmetric. So you're doing symmetric matrix factorization. So how is it that small random initialization helps? Actually, very simple, okay? 
So look at just the first gradient. So believe me that this is the formula for gradient descent here. So this is what the first gradient is. So now imagine the, the initialization is small, right? So I can ignore this term compared to this term, right? It's really that easy. So then you have some fixed matrix times u0, right? So that's the first gradient update. So if I plug it into the gradient descent update, I end up with a fixed matrix times u0. So this matrix does not depend on the optimization variable, right? So why is this, uh, well, uh, so, so, but you can imagine as I'm running gradient descent, at least initially, I, because I started small, I'm not going to grow very large. So, so this approximation kind of holds initially, right? So it's as if I'm kind of keep multiplying by this matrix initially. So it's essentially I'm running power method on, on, on this matrix. So, so now the only question is why is it that running power method on this matrix is good, right? So it turns out that this matrix, right, at least under these random models, RIP models, essentially approximate XX transpose, right? So if I run power method on this, I'm actually basically getting the, the eigenspaces correctly. So, so that's, that's what's happening. And this is kind of interesting because back in the day, this is how we, would, we used to initialize. We're saying gradient descent from small random initialization automatically does that for you in these over-parameterized cases. So it's kind of a really cool thing. And again, this is not just a, you know, a made up story based on theory. It actually is true in practice. Like you, you, you can actually see this happening. This approximation is fairly good initially. Uh, the actual story is more complicated than this. There's multiple phases. So there is this phase where you align these eigenvectors. Then there is kind of a saddle avoidance phase where you show certain, uh, basically you escape certain saddle points. So there's a second phase. And then finally, you're close enough that you could do a local convergence phase. But really, the key insight is still the first phase. The key insight that makes these proofs work is the first phase. The other two phases are a bit more technical. OK, so, so that's, uh, that's kind of the story for uh, low rank stuff. So let me kind of briefly tell you how, what are the implications without doing any kind of proof for, for one hidden layer neural networks. So this part is actually joint work with uh, uh, Alex Domian and Jason Lee at Princeton. So here, uh, what we focus on is trying to learn polynomials using uh, one hidden layer neural network. So, so in particular, we are assuming the inputs are Gaussian. And then we, we're kind of learning a polynomial on top of a linear representation. So, so this is a polynomial of degree p from little r to r. So it's a multivariate polynomial. And then u is like kind of a fat matrix, kind of the linear representation. So r is less than d. Now, the model we use to train this uh, on this data is, is actually just a one hidden layer neural network. Uh, and, and the algorithm is just running gradient descent on the least squares cost. Again, from small random initialization. So now, why is it that uh, kind of like this is a good problem to study uh, for, for small random initialization versus large? Is that there's actually a lower bound for this kind of lazy NTK regime, which says that uh, in the, this lazy NTK regime, you would need at least d to the p many samples, d being the input dimension, p being the degree of polynomial, to actually learn this class of polynomials using neural networks, even if the, the, there's infinitely many hidden units. So, so in this lazy or NTK regime of operation, you need at least this many samples. What we can show is that actually with just a finite number of hidden units, if you run gradient descent, but now from small random initialization, so you're out of this NTK regime, uh, you actually can get away with much, much fewer samples. So the, the contrast is like r to the p, r being the smaller dimension, versus d to the p. And in fact, r could be order constant, really. So, so this is almost an exponential improvement in sample complexity. Uh, and really, the reason for that is because you, you kind of learn the right features. And, and so the, the next example actually demonstrates this well. Go ahead. So in the, when you're saying the NTK regime, you're saying smaller steps, uh, smaller initialization. So it could be a, 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 a three different things. It could be either large initialization, wider network, or small step size. They, they kind of all interact. But uh, all of them, because you know this is based on a kernel, right? This is approximated well by a kernel. The kernel has the sample complexity limit. Yeah. Other questions? So the, the good thing about this result is that you could also start to explain some of these contemporary practices, like for example, what people do in transfer learning. Uh, 
So here the setting is that they say you have little end source data and capital and target data. And so imagine the source data is generated according to one of these polynomials. The target data is generated according to another one of these polynomials. But they say, share the same hidden representation. So they share the same U. But the polynomial head varies. So, so this is kind of a toy transfer learning setting. So in this context, what you would do with transfer learning is that you would train both layers on the source data. right? You train both layers. Then you fix the first layer and then retrain the last layer uh, on, on the target data, right? So this is where this is a very common practice in transfer learning. You learn uh, on your more abundant source data. You free some layers, retrain like the, the next few layers on the target data, and and so we show that in this at least in kind of this toy transfer learning model, uh, you actually can get away with much fewer target data in the sense that. You know, using the source data, you will learn the hidden representation. You just need enough target data to learn the new polynomial head. So if you notice, this is the sample complexity you would need to learn the new polynomial head. It's as if you already learned you, right, from the source data. So it, it kind of even starts to explain like this, uh, this kind of feature learning uh, or transfer learning uh, with these modern heuristics, right? And again, I think the reason for this is because you're learning the right features rather than using the frozen features that the, that the NTK kernel provides, essentially. And so finally, we don't actually have theorems for this, right? Uh, but I'll just tell you uh, what, what, how does this NTK versus non-NTK manifest itself into N, in end-to-end -end training, at least empirically. And of course, you know, it's another Stan Osher picture that you usually do have to show at IPAM, right? So, uh, so we have that too. <laughs> So, so in particular, let's just see how this kind of, uh, you know, this kind of NTK versus non-NTK manifests itself into end-to-end -end denoising of piecewise linear signals, right? So uh, here the data is said is like, I, I take a piecewise linear signal, I add Gaussian noise to it, so, so that's kind of the input. And the, cor and the corresponding labels or output is like kind of the noise desk signal, right? And then in the in the end-to-end -end training, if I want to do end-to-end -end training uh, on uh, to do this kind of denoising, you would get a bunch of input output pairs like this, and then you would kind of train a one hidden layer neural network to, to do this denoising for you, right? So in this case, for example, say let's say a one hidden layer ReLU network. Let's say using a least squares loss, right? So so this is a very toy model of the end-to-end -end training that I discussed at the beginning. Uh, and again, there is actually a major difference whether you use gradient descent from small or large initialization. And here is kind of some videos to show this. So if you use large initialization, you actually don't end up learning the piecewise constant signal. You actually learn up very again end end up learning something that is uh, you know very noisy signal. If you use small initialization, it it does seem to do. I guess this video is not playing. <laughs> Yeah, if you do small initialization, it's constant, but eventually it will pick up. It will actually learn exactly the piecewise constant signal, right? So, so it kind of does something more like TV versus like L2, right? So this is the difference between NTK and non-NTK, right? Um, so we don't have full theory for this yet, but it's kind of interesting. It's the same phenomena, right? And so if you look at the generalization and chain error, there's again three phases. There is in fact a spectral alignment phase. There is, seems to be like a kind of a saddle avoidance phase, and then there does seem to be a local convergence phase. So actually, the insights from low rank reconstruction, as always, they actually carry out pre, carry over pretty nicely to to, to neural networks. Um, it's still, it's a full neural, fully connected neural network. Yeah, yeah it's still full. So, so we, that is a different question. Like the architecture is not yet. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll skip these, but I was just explaining these phases here. So so let me wrap up. So, so again, I talked about these new architectures uh, for MR reconstruction. I was hoping to actually give you theory both on, uh, on the end-to-end -end and the transformational side, but you know, this has been a busy semester, so we're not there yet. <laughs> but, uh, you know, uh, but instead, I kind of told you a little bit how feature learning via gradient descent works, right? And uh, hopefully you saw that there is at least some vague connection uh, between the two. <laughs> hopefully this connection will be more clear. But the main insight was that uh, to tell you how you can go beyond this lazy training regime. And the key idea was that somehow gradient descent uh, 
uh, the trajectory of gradients is very particular. It's actually very intimately related to power method on certain matrices and tensors. And this is what you can exploit to do like, uh, gen to characterize the generalization behavior of neural networks. So yeah, let me end it there. Thank you.